All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, meeting here on a Thursday morning. Hope you guys got some coffee and some breakfast to discuss a very important, timely topic. Today we have two amazing speakers. Uh, Pedro Abramovay is the current vice president at programs at Open Society Foundation. He held a series of key positions within Brazil Ministry of Justice, including most notably the Secretary of Justice from 2010 to 2011. He played key roles in helping draft significant policies and legislations on gun control, prison reform, uh, internet freedom. He served as a campaign director for Avaz, leading campaigns against corruption and human rights in Latin America. Uh, he, was also, he was also a professor at FGV Law School in Rio, where I graduated from, so it's <laughs> great. Yes, me was also a professor there, so we have uh, a great uh, connection to that, that great school. Uh, yes, I mean, I'll present her when she gets here, hopefully very soon. Uh, Professor Carroll, who you all know, he is a current uh, is a faculty here at WCL and faculty director on our great program on information, justice, and intellectual property. I'd like to thank the Brazil-U.S. Legal Judicial Studies Program, the Program on International Justice and Intellectual Property, and the Tech Law and Security Program for co-sponsoring this event. We are being recorded. We hope to be able to post this recording online later. We have many people who couldn't be here today but are interested in the topic, so you've been warned. All right. Uh, on that note, without further ado, uh, Pedro, you want to get us started? Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, first time here in the campus. So, uh, uh, But uh, as we were discussing before, Open Society and American University have uh, uh, a lot of partnerships, so, so really uh, 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 nice to be here. Um, I will, uh, we had in fact, uh, Yasmin and I, uh, uh, agreed that she would start and give more of a specifics, uh, on the case, on the kind of Twitter, uh, uh, case in Brazil. And I will complement with the kind of broader, uh, uh, context, political context. Uh, but I think we'll switch now and, and, and I'll start and, and you get, uh, the, be the, the best part, uh, in the end, uh, with her. Uh, but I think um, in some ways it can work well. And um, I think it's important to, to uh, 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 and I will start kind of uh, maybe 15 years ago. But before we do that, I think it's important to recognize, because uh, I imagine you don't, uh, or uh, many of you don't follow uh, daily Brazilian news, that this is a particularly important week, right? This uh, uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, the Supreme Court uh, le released uh, an investigation or parts of an investigation that showed that <clears throat> what we knew, uh, right, and, and I think it's easy in the U.S. to relate, right, we had our January 6th, uh, two years later, and January 8th in Brazil, right, so invasion of uh, not only in Brazil, not only the Congress, but uh, the presidential palace and the Supreme Court, and that's very important for our discussion here. But what, we, what was released uh, yesterday at, is that not only the evasion uh, happened, but there was, and we knew already, there was a clear plot to a, a coup uh, by the military uh, in Brazil, supported by a network of, kind of fake news and disinformation in many uh, parts. And I think, again, easy to relate being here. Uh, but that, that what was released uh, this week is that there was uh, a plan that was almost executed to kill Alexandre de Moraes, the justice here, President Lula when he was president elected, and his running mate, right? So this was, and there were four, at least four, uh, generals, uh, four stars general involved in the plot and almost executing the plan, right? So this was, I think it's very important to start and have this in mind when we start to discuss that, that everything we're discussing here was happening and has this kind of a, uh, 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 a context, right, of a clear uh, coup attempt in Brazil uh, that happened specifically uh, uh, led by President Bolsonaro and his uh, military uh, allies. But I'll start 15 years uh, ago because I think it's important, first of all, to understand the moment. And I was uh, uh, part of, uh, uh, I was in the administration uh, when we drafted the first regulation that Yasmin will talk uh, a lot, that was a relation to establish rights and freedom uh, in the Brazilian internet that we called Marco Civil de Internet, Internet Legal Framework. Uh, in Brazil, this was something 
that was the product of uh, a joint work by uh, the administration, civil society, and a, a, a big agreement that was, uh, uh, it was the first, uh, we talk a lot about the Finnish and the Iceland uh, constitution, but it was the first, first wiki uh, and collaborative effort to kind of build uh, 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 a legislation based on kind of this collaborative effort on the internet with civil society uh, and companies, corporations, debating uh, in a blog at the time, it was 15 years ago, uh, all the, the, the discussion and then going through parliament and it was a big victory of civil society. I think that's important because as you'll see, um, the internet uh, legal framework was the center of the, the debate between uh, uh, Elon Musk or Twitter X uh, and the Supreme Court. But it's important to say that the main point of the, the legislation at the time was to assure freedom and to make sure, explicit, there were many points, but one of the net neutrality and others, but this specific point was to assure that no one would have uh, uh, posts or opinions removed from the internet without due process and without uh, the, the a judicial uh, uh, decision, which at the time was very advanced and, and definitely not in line with uh, some of the, the, the practices uh, in other parts of the world. And in that moment, there was a clear alliance between uh, civil society and big tech. Right, they wanted the same thing, right? And 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 the kind of progressive government uh, in the administration, they wanted the same thing. And the opponents were mainly law and order uh, uh, in parts of it, and and uh, banks and telecom. I won't enter into this, but I think that's an important context at the time, because as we'll see, this you know the the, the, the general context changes, right? And uh, and big tech and civil society and the progressives will be in a complete uh, uh, opposite side. So that's the first part, I think, in terms of the context. The second part, of course, is we need to understand, you know, to even start to understand what happened in Brazil during this process, our Supreme Court and our uh, in, uh, uh, judicial independence, which is very different from uh, the U.S., right? I think we can say, although we have a similar process to many people, uh, justice to, to the Supreme Court, for the rest of the federal judiciary, it's very different. The role of the executive is much less important uh, than, than it is in the U.S. Uh, has some, but it's much less important than here. Right? The role of, uh, uh, it, it is much more treated as a civil servant's bureaucracy with exams and all that uh, than, than, than it is uh, uh, here in the U.S. Also, the fact that Brazil is not a bipartisan uh, uh, country, right, and has a plurality of parties, it is much harder to clearly identify one justice, even if nominated by one particular uh, uh, president, to clearly identify one justice as, you know, uh, uh, belonging to one party or another, right? Here it's clear we can say there are some, you know, we have six Republican justices and three Democratic this is not this is not a logic that uh, at least until now uh, can be uh, seen in the U.S. Of course, there are more conservative, less conservative, but justices uh, uh, nominated by progressive administration could be quite conservative, and the other way around. I think that's also important to understand that when Bolsonaro is elected, uh, of course he has no majority in the court, right? It's the first time a far-right president is elected uh, uh, in Brazil. But the court is not at all hostile to him, right? And, uh, and you know, the, the, even if there was the threats and there was this uh, anecdote during his campaign, his son uh, was, I think, in a, in a space like that, kind of giving a course in a, I think, university or something like that. But his son said, and his son is a politician, right, in Brazil. We, we, that's another similarity, right, that we have uh, uh, from Brazil and the U.S., that the kind of authoritarian presidents that have son that is, that are pro, uh, you know, the preeminent uh, speakers, let's say. Uh, so, so he was speaking in a space like that, and he said, you know, if you want to close the Supreme Court, that's very easy. You need just uh, two soldiers and a jeep, right, and then you can close the Supreme Court. So even if Bolsonaro and his you know, uh, uh, family and, and, and team were quite hostile to the Supreme Court during the election. The truth is the court received him as an, 
and I, I remember a, a private conversation I had with a, a, a justice between Bolsonaro's election and and uh, and his inauguration, saying, "Are you prepared for what will come? Right, this will be the Supreme Court will need to exercise checks and balances in a way that." It has never been tested, or the only time that has been tested failed, which was during the dictatorship. Uh, so, are you? And he said, you know, Pedro, this is part of the the kind of democratic uh, regular process. We have a right wing president. We need to be, you know, normalize that. This is not, of course, we can't take uh, his speech by the value of faith. It won't be that hard, right? So, the the, the general perspective from the court was, I think, went much more welcoming than one could. Imagine when the government starts, and I think in the beginning, even uh, justices that were nominated by Lula or Dilma would kind of go into the palace and. Uh, is me. <laughs> no problem. We we, we start. We just started. We just started. Okay. <laughs> so. And I think that's important also to mention there was an attempt of normality, right? And But then, and I think that's also very important uh, to make a difference between the U.S. and Brazil, which is the system in Brazil, the level of independence that the attorney general has in Brazil is completely different from what they, they, they have in the U.S. First of all, it's not kind of a, uh, although it's, uh, it's, it's a presidential appointment, uh, the president can only uh, appoint uh, federal prosecutors to that position, which is clearly different from, from the U.S. And once the, the person is appointed, the level of freedom they have, the level of freedom the career has, is completely different, right? So the whole system in Brazil is based on an idea of independence of, I can't even call it attorney general because it's, it's a different, like, it doesn't oversee the Department of Justice, right? It's very different, right? It oversees the, 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 the prosecutors and it's the head of kind of the prosecution uh, department and, uh, uh, in Brazil. It could never, for example, oversee the Solicitor General Department as it does here. It's a completely different because the key element in the Brazilian Constitution of the Attorney General Office, the, let's call it, I don't know how to translate it to, to make sure we, we have the, the, let's say the kind of general prosecutor uh, office, is independence, right? And the system is based on the idea that we have a general uh, prosecutor, which is independent. So what Bolsonaro does is that he nominates someone, and there was a tradition of the federal prosecutors voting uh, and giving a list of three for the president. That was kind of, since Lula, it was, uh, 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 for, so for 20 years, it was being kind of uh, uh, ob uh, obeyed. And then Bolsonaro gets out of it and nominated a federal prosecutor that are very close to him. And then, uh, breaking with the tradition of independence, he begins clearly to operate, I would say, much more as an American-style attorney general, right? Which is much closer, almost part of Bolsonaro's cabinet, right? So this creates a dysfunction in the system that was clearly perceived by the Supreme Court in the first one. But still, nothing that I think uh, uh, demanded a clear reaction. Then COVID came, right? And then the tension between... Uh, the government and the Supreme Court started to, because governors were kind of willing to do more kind of serious measures against COVID, and Bolsonaro was attacking them and trying to rule them. And the Supreme Court was, in general, you know, uh, 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 accepting the governor's uh, argument and being much more, uh, uh, let's say, pro uh, uh, public health than the government. Then the tension starts, and Bolsonaro starts to attack the court constantly saying, you know, he was not able to govern because of the court. And, and the next step is he begins to attack the, not only, and he was already kind of escalating his speech against adversaries and, and against, right, we're seeing the, the authoritarian escalate. The Supreme Court, Supreme Court was still quite quiet. But then he begins to attack the, the electoral system. And uh, this, particularly in 21, so two years before the election, something that he always did along all his life, right? But he, he, he begins to go live and say he'll have proofs, right? And he'll start to kind of operate on a base of a network of, uh, of disinformation that we're seeing in the country and clearly attacking, seeing he had proved that the Supreme Court justices were corrupt, that, you know, they were controlling the election. And that's a difference also. In Brazil, we have elections are ruled by the judiciary, right? Uh, 
It's different from the U.S. that it's the executive branch in the states that run elections. In Brazil, it's the judiciary that runs elections, which, of course, gives much more independence. We'll never have the kind of tension that we have in this country around the specifics, uh, vote counting and, and all that. But, of course, it puts the judiciary at the center of the attacks when you are attacking uh, uh, elections or uh, calling for electoral fraud. It, it was the first time it was happening at that scale that we have a president, especially a winning president, that was attacking the, the electoral court. And the electoral court is presided by one of the Supreme Court justices, right? So it created, it started to create a tension between Bolsonaro and the Supreme Court that was uh, the first time we were seeing something like that. And then the Supreme Court starts to react. And it starts to create, react based on two things. One, because it was clear that no investigation against the government was going to go further because they had completely captured the prosecutor general office. So there was kind of a, uh, a lack of balance in the, stru- in the constitutional structure that we had uh, 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 for, you know, that is based on the independence of the prosecutor, the general prosecutor uh, uh, office, right? So the Supreme Court said we need, and started saying, we need to react. We need to be able to preside over investigations because there is no investigation happening uh, 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 from the, 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 the general prosecutor. One of the main investigations were, for example, the lack of, you know, a corruption case around vaccines that happened, right? That the Congress started to investigate, but Congress can go so far, and it has to continue with the prosecutor's uh, general prosecutor office and refused to go for the reason. So based on the the disinformation network that was happening under COVID and against elections, the Supreme Court and the fact that the Supreme Court was being attacked directly by the president. I think that's very important. I don't know if they would do anything if they weren't being directly and personally attacked by the, by the president. The Supreme Court decided to start and to preside over an investigation. There was internal rules from the Supreme Court. The Constitution is silent, at least, <laughs> to say on that. There were internal rules uh, 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 from the uh, uh, Supreme Court that, uh, that uh, uh, recognized the possibility of the Supreme Court to preside uh, uh, police investigation in some cases, and they take that which would be an exception and create a big investigation on disinformation. This was kind of fake news, right? And of course, the fake news network was not something that was running in the vacuum, right? It was presided from inside uh, the presidential palace, right? So. Having, doing that was a clear attack also, and it was perceived as an attack uh, from, uh, from uh, Bolsonaro. So that investigation starts to require a level of uh, uh, compliance from uh, uh, big tech that was in tension with the legislation that, we, that, I, that was uh, uh, kind of freedom of expression, uh, or the, the internet uh, uh, legal framework that I, that I presented in the beginning, right? So having, and of course it was, we're talking about judicial decisions, but the kind of, they were requiring uh, some of the, 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 the companies to you know, comply and uh, uh, take out uh, uh, posts in two hours, for example, which is clearly uh, uh, something that was being seen as radical, although it happens in, in in other countries, right? So, of course, the 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 investigation created a tension with the administration, but also with big tech, right? Especially at the time with Facebook and and Google, that would in general comply. Sometimes they would say it's impossible; it's technically impossible to do it. Then the Supreme Court would say, "Well, you need to do it, and that's uh, it's mandatory." And then they would do it, showing that. It was not impossible to, to do it technically, but the tension was there, right? And, and that investigation was escalating into a level that was getting closer to, to President Bolsonaro, right? Uh, on his role on fake news, on his attacks on the electoral system, right? And his, uh, uh, on, on spreading this information on public health and on uh, elections in general. And that tension reached a, a, a point in which Bolsonaro called the mob uh, and this was one year before uh, the elections on the kind of Brazil Independence Day, uh, September 7th, to go in front of the Supreme Court. And he made a speech there saying he will not, not uh, 
uh, uh, obey any more uh, orders from Justice Alexandre de Moraes, who was presiding uh, this investigation, right? And and there was we were you know just uh, uh, it was really, they they got really close to the Supreme Court, and part of the military kind of opened ways for them to arrive, and it was just. Uh, we could have seen the invasion that we saw one year later, one year and a half later, at this moment. So the tension between the Supreme Court and the presidency at the moment reached a level that was not just, uh, you know, checks and balances. Uh, it was uh, uh, like it was at a level of kind of again almost a, a coup uh, uh, level, right? And this, of course, there are people trying to moderate in both sides, and but then we get into the elections. Bolsonaro, and of course, the tension between the court and the court always, I would say, testing the limits of what the court could do in a case like that. And of course, public justifying the act by saying, we don't, the, the, the current structures for investigation for checks and balance are captured by the presidency. So we need to react, right? So we need to establish. And so the court was. Uh, 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 so when the elections come, Bolsonaro is uh, 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 lose the election, don't, doesn't recognize the results, and uh, a considerable group of support of Bolsonaro supporters start camping in front of military uh, facilities, asking for uh, uh, a military intervention at the call, asking for a coup. Right? The Supreme Court. Although they didn't ask for immediate removal of those people from right the, the those facilities and all that, was still kind of uh, uh, quite harsh on you know maintaining the investigations and the orders and asking for all the posts around those issues to be removed. Right, and again the tension was, moving. and then we get into January. So Lula is inaugurated, uh, and then first there was first an. Uh, uh, a truck that exploded in Brasilia in front of the federal police between the election and the inauguration. So, again, the violence coming from those mobs, from those protests and all that, were clear and on the streets and all based on the kind of network of disinformation we were talking about. Then we had January 8th, right? So, a day after the, uh, a week after the inauguration, in which the, the mobs come out of those facilities and enter the three palaces. And again, there was a tension. Uh, the, the, the government tried to remove the people from the facilities by force, and the army uh, prevented putting, putting tanks in front of the government forces and saying, you are not coming here to remove. And this was because it was not only uh, people who were supporting Bolsonaro, but it was the families of the generals who were camping in, this, in those places. Right? So the tension between the army the elected president and the Supreme Court reach the level that I think is very important. And we know right now, and then okay, after that, the investigation that was already kind of testing all the limits of what rule of law could be, now, of course, they feel legitimate, le legitimized to go way beyond that. And then they arrest around 800 people involved in the mobs, right? And, and uh and then, of course, it creates, as we've seen here, right, also a victimization. Bolsonaro always defending them, right? I think the same way that we, the parallels with Trump are uh, 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 really big. So that's, I think that's, and, and what we know right now is that during this moment, as I said, like the first thing I said here, right, which is we know that not only they were kind of really, this was not just a, a, a mob, Right, going there freely, but there was the high ranks of the military and Bolsonaro's uh, kind of chief of staff, Bolsonaro running mate, the general, participating in this plot to kill the president elected, uh, Supreme Court Justice Alexandre Moraes, who was presiding this uh, uh, this investigation, and uh, and and, and uh, vice president, yeah, and uh, vice president Gerald Cohn, right? So that. So when, and, and Yasmin will, will uh, uh, I think that's a good segue for Yasmin to, to, to start explaining exactly what happened uh, 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 in the tension with, with Twitter, uh, Elon Musk, and all that. Uh, 
But I think we can't uh, uh, try to see that discussion in the vacuum, right? It was, uh, uh, and, and I have a lot of criticism on what the way the Supreme Court handled it and the way and, and the excesses on the investigation and all of that. But if we don't have a military dictatorship in Brazil right now, if uh, uh, the, the, the coup attempt was not successful, it was also because of uh, the role of the Supreme Court and those investigations during this period. Right. So for me here, it's we need to really, I think the discussion is much more how we preserve constitution, how we preserve the rule of law in a context of the level of, the, of masses information and of the respect uh, for democracy and the institutions coming from within as we saw in Brazil. And welcome to it again, I think, <laughs> from January uh, here in this country. May I ask two clarifying questions? That was, that was brilliant, but especially on behalf of our sure. uh, first year students. So, uh, you know, uh, as a civil law country, the, the courts are operating in a, what we call a ministerial model, whereas we have this uh, adversarial model that you're being taught by Professor Rivero. So, our courts are not allowed to engage in fact investigation. Yeah. Right? We require the attorneys to, to do that. So, it would help me to understand two questions. Two things. It sounded to me like you were saying the scope of that fact and that the court's fact investigation power is somewhat ambivalent or ambiguous, yeah. right? And so I, maybe a comment on when you talk about the Supreme Court going too far, what's the legal principle okay. that, and, and also why have the Supreme Court do the fact investigation? Yeah. rather than have a lower court. Yeah. Those, those two things are, are very different than yeah. what we think about. It. So the Supreme Court in Brazil has uh, many roles, but two particularly different roles. One is quite similar to the U.S., which is ju uh, constitutional jurisdiction, right? So it is the ability to review uh, uh, um, the constitutionality of, of uh, 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 laws approved by Congress, right? And that's very similar. But it has a different role also, which is they are the original criminal court for some authorities uh, in, the, in the Republic. So they are the original criminal court for acts of ministers, of uh, uh, Congress uh, people, and some of the crimes uh, from the president, right? So if the investigation involves people from Congress, and that's where it started, in fact, and it went to the Supreme Court because there were Congress people involved in, in the misinformation uh, networks and clearly attacking, like directly funding, directly <laughs> engaging in this information. And, and so that was what allowed the Supreme Court to have the investigation. I, I, I say it exceeds because, first of all, the investigation should not have, should not start by a request of the, the the Supreme Court should start by request of the uh, uh, general prosecutor, right? And I'm trying not to call it attorney general because, again, it's it's a very diff different. It is uh, uh, it should be much more independent. What happened is they took advantage of an internal rule that I think it's a lot of people would say it's probably not constitutional, and and uh, but it is an internal rule, and who you know evaluates the validity and the constitutionality of that rule is the Supreme Court. So. Uh, that allowed, in some cases, when the Supreme Court is affected, for them to start an investigation, right? And so they used that to start the, 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 the fake news case. What happened after, and I think Yasmin can, can, can talk about it too, but is that this became, a, 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 you know, all cases related, it's Everything is related to misinformation right now, right? So everything that is somehow was related to this information, they kind of took into that investigation. And I think this is, of course, an excess, right? This is something that, uh, that if it happened in any other case, would not be tolerated. But, but we need to see it in, in that context to understand. Well, thanks, Jasmine, for, for coming here. Uh, Jasmine, she's a professor at FGV Law School in Rio de Janeiro where she teaches international human rights, internet policy, AI and human rights. She's currently a fellow at the Karsh Institute of Democracy at the University of Virginia. Uh, she has been involved in numerous projects on platform regulation, funded by the UN, the European Commission, and others. She was also recently nominated to the National Cybersecurity Committee, Brazil, 
very impressive. And she has written extensively on different topics, including most notably the impact on online gender-based viol uh, violence on women's participation in digital spaces. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Professor Ibero. Thank you, Professor Bramove, as well. I would like first to apologize for my delay here. I live currently live in Charlottesville for my fellowship, so I came by driving three hours in advance, but it wasn't enough to arrive on time, so I apologize once again. Uh, so, as Professor Abram, I tried to prepare my presentation to speak before Professor Brumovai, so I would give you first an introduction about uh, the Brazilian legislation for internet regulation. I don't know how much uh, Professor Bermuda okay. already talked okay. about Max Civil Internet, the Internet Bill of Rights in Brazil, uh, but I'm going to highlight the, the main, the main uh, provisions and also uh, try to introduce a bit about the Electoral Circuit, the Electoral Court uh, jurisdiction. Uh, the main topic of this session is to talk about also the blocking of acts in Brazil, the, most of you, I think, probably kept up with this uh, in the news here in August. I wrote this piece to the conversation in case you want any details of what I'm talking about here today. It's basically uh, already written in this article. And the spoiler alert about this is Musk has been trying to, to point out about, about Brazil. We are not under a dictatorship that was not the case about Twitter being censored, as Professor Abramovay uh, already mentioned. We have legislations and it was according to them that the, suspen the suspension was, uh, uh, took, was a measure adopted by the Supreme Court to uh, be able to actually enforce the, leg the Brazilian legislation that X was not complying with. So. Regarding the, this legislation, we have the Consumers Protection Code, we have the Civil Code, the Brazilian Civil Rights Framework for the Internet or the Internet Bill of Rights in Brazil, the General Data Protection Act, the Elections Act, as well as, as other lateral legislations regarding the elections, and the Superior Electoral Court resolutions. The court has also this power to uh, enact resolutions like ordinances that, according to the Supreme Court uh, case law, have the has the power of law, has the same degree, is equivalent as law, and is constitutional for the Electoral Court to do so. Since a recent rule from the Supreme Court in 2022, December of 2022. And so here, uh, I would like to mention only the Brazilian Civil Rights Framework for the Internet in the case of Acts and the Civil Code. So we have uh, in the, frame, the, the Internet Framework of, uh, of for the Internet, sorry, we have some provisions. Uh, this law was enacted in 2014, uh, entered in force in 2016, so it's like a decade ago, we were not debating them, then this information or as, as the, with the intensity that we are seeing this debate right now. Uh, the key provisions that we tried, and Professor Bramovai was also in the discussion and elaboration of this bill. The main discussions here were, was uh, freedom of expression and user privacy, uh, privacy rights regarding uh, possible rec records by uh, police authorities, cryptography of communications. We were also talking about network neutrality, uh, the need to establish uh, non-discriminatory uh, rules in data practices by uh, enterprises. Uh, and the civil rights framework also established an intermediary liability regime in, that, in its Article 18 from 21. Basically, at this time, we had the same discussions that uh, here in the U.S. were all also ongoing through the, 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 the late 90s and the beginning of the, the, the 2000s. 
because many internet service providers were uh, held liable by uh, high, uh, by lowest, lower courts because they hosted content that was unlawful. And this was in disagreement with all the internet regulation studies uh, that basically uh, exempt uh, the service providers of uh, liability. So Article 18 was basically enacted, I don't know if you can read this here, but enacted to protect them, to give them immunity about this, an article to internet service providers, and Article 19 created a liability regime for uh, platforms, websites, uh, messaging apps, blogs, so they could be also, uh, also uh, be, have this immunity regarding content produced by users, user-generated content. And of, there are two except, exemptions of, uh, from the, the general paragraph of the, the, this general regime uh, that Article, Article 19 establishes, that are the paragraph 2 and the Article 21. I'm going to mention it briefly after, but just so we can understand, the Article 19 it's, it establishes a judicial notice and takedown regime as this uh, general intermediary liability. It means that platforms are only liable for UGC, for user-generated content, if they fail to comply with a specific court order within their capacities to make such content unavailable. That is, if the platform cannot, for example, WhatsApp, the VP of WhatsApp was once arrested, in a, had a, a, a warrant uh, issued for, for her arrest, uh, in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, because uh, this judge from a lower court thought that uh, WhatsApp could uh, make communications unencrypted, that it could uh, dec uh, remove the, the encryption of the communications. It is impossible, it's technically impossible to do so, and they issued her arrest because she was not com uh, complying with the legislation. But of course, this was reviewed by the higher court and the decision uh, was completely uh, unlawful regarding the, uh, the general regime of the, the Maxwell Internet, the Internet Bill of Rights. It's worth mentioning also that this article is under, currently under discussion within the Supreme Court Probably this will be uh, discussed in the November 27 next next week, but I don't know anymore because with all these things that happened this week, probably it can be postponed again. It actually would take place last year in 2020 the discussion, but uh, the Supreme Court caps caps postponing it. Uh, the main lawsuit that uh, brought this case to the Supreme Court was uh, in 2016, 2017, and brought by internet service providers mainly. Uh, I'm one of the authors of an amicus curi that it is uh, in this, this, this case. What specialists are trying to, to highlight, and probably it is the decision that uh, the, the, the the position that the Supreme Court is going to take in this case, following all this movement that it has been taking uh, to enforce uh, big techs to be more uh, responsible regarding the content that they host. It is uh, another interpretation of the Article 19 with a risk-based approach. Uh, another, uh, uh, so they have, they could be they could count on this immunity only if they uh, have actually in implement mechanisms to <coughs> mitigate uh, harmful content within their, their systems. That's the position that we also uh, uh, t take in this, in this amicus curiae. And as the, the recent developments show, probably it's going to be the stance that uh, the Supreme Court is going to take. But let's see how this goes. And regarding uh, the Brazilian frame, framework, framework for platform regulation, 
We also had this fake, the fake news bill, an attempt to create a legislation quite similar to the Digital Services Act in the European Union and the online safety, uh, safety bill in the uh, United Kingdom, trying to enact platforms duties, such as the duty of care, due process, transparency rules, users' rights, such as the right to appeal, the right to a motive in a decision from a platform to remove or censor uh, their content, and also measures for harmful content mitigation, such as a change in the Article 19 regime from the Internet Bill of Rights that uh, counted on basically platforms would be li uh, consider considered liable for recommended content, for the, co the content that they also allowed to be sponsored, both by recommenders, algorithmic recommend the recommendation systems and by paid advertiser advertisement. This disposition, this provision in the, fake, the draft bill 2630 really uh, concerned the big tech platforms and they did several attempts and have, uh, have lobby within the Congress to stop this bill to make it to, to be archived and not advance within the discussion. Google, for example, even uh, put on this on its main page a uh, uh, quotation saying that fake, the fake news bill would censor and end free speech, actually, end free speech in Brazil. This was advertised in the main page of Google. They also bought several ads in newspapers, creating a fake news campaign against the fake news bill. And this is currently under investigation uh, within the competition authority, still under discussion, uh, because some, uh, some experts also consider this would be abuse of market power by Google. But how does all of it relate with uh, Elon Musk and X suspension in Brazil? First of all, to enforce the legislation, we need platform, we need companies in general, not only big tech platforms, but companies in general that operate in Brazil to have a legal representation and act appointed. So the courts can actually uh, issue orders if there are any, any issue or any rights violations for Brazilian citizens, they have to enact, they have to appoint a legal representation in Brazil, legal representative. According to recent case law, this legal representation, legal representative doesn't need to be physically in Brazil even, it just needs to be appointed so the Supreme Court or other courts can issue the orders to them. Elon Musk, with all this, uh, his, his support of Bolsonaro and other gov right-wing governments uh, in the world, uh, has been test was testing the limits of the Supreme Court. And within these two inquiries that Professor Brumovai mentioned, the fake news inquiry and the anti-democratic inquiry, anti-democratic acts, inquiry that was also created after the Brazilian capital in 2022, 2023, sorry. Uh, there, are, there were several, uh, several decisions, not only from the Supreme Court, but also from the Electoral Court to uh, ordering the removal of content that was uh, considered illicit or unlawful by those courts as the Article 19 uh, establishes. We, have, we need this decision so the platform can actually uh, comply with the removal. And X, since Musk's acquisition in 2022, said that he wouldn't apply any content moderation rules. This goes against Brazilian legislation. Uh, he needed actually to comply with the the court orders, and he didn't want to. 
first because of his support of Bolsonaro, but also any other issues, for example, doxing, uh, non-consensual intimate imagery dissemination, all of this, uh, all of those contents that are unlawful, X was not removing. So it created a, it actually puts, uh, put it, uh, the Supreme Court and other courts in a, a difficult position and several attempts of dialogue with acts was were ongoing first they actually uh, appointed a legal representative uh, that was answering replying to the demands of the courts but then this last year they actually stopped it in april uh, we started to see memes from musk uh, to, uh, uh, naming Alexandre de Moraes, the Justice Alexandre de Moraes, as uh, the Star Wars, the Darth Vader uh, character, as he was actually the, the dictator in Brazil, as, but he is only a justice of the Supreme Court. He is not even the president, as Musk was trying to, to, to put him in this position as a dictator. And so, first of all, they are they were not complying with Article 19 from Democracy with the Internet, but also they were not complying, uh, they started to not comply even more heavily in uh, August when they actually removed, when X removed the legal representation from Brazil totally. So, they, the Supreme Court, it's only uh, possibilities for its action. And this is also established in Marxism with the Internet, in the Internet Bill of Rights in Brazil, in its Article 10. There are several uh, degrees of, pen of penalties that uh, companies that do not comply with the legislation can be held liable to. First, economic, uh, financial san sanctions, then uh, only advert uh, advertences. I forgot how to say this. Uh, like warn warnings yeah. and then uh, suspension like a temporary suspe suspension of the the platform and last of all the last resort the complete suspension of the services in the country and that's the way that must the path that must created for itself and for acts in brazil uh another issue that the Braz the brazilian supreme court had to deal with was regarding Starlink's operation in Brazil, regarding this, uh, the, the possible, uh, the possibilities, the actually material possibilities of the blocking of X in Brazil. Starlink, the most other enterprise of a satellite internet by, by, provided by satellites that is huge in Brazil right now, it provides 46% uh, of the internet services in Brazil right now. Uh, it was it, it began its operations in Brazil like two years ago, and it's now for, uh, responsible for 46% of the internet in the country. It's huge, its operations right now. But the Starlink basically said that it wasn't not, it was not going to block Twitter X, sorry, in Brazil. Uh, it was not going to comply with the Supreme Court order. With this, the Supreme Court block also Starlink's uh, bank accounts in Brazil, saying that if it was protecting uh, X in this manner, it was actually a, a financial uh, an economic conglomerate, so an only comp a sole company uh, that could also be responsible for X's uh, non complicity with the non compliance with the legislation. And of course, after this uh, communication, Starlink uh, retur returned with uh, its position. It stated that it was going to block Twitter in Brazil. It blocked Twitter. And finally, Elon Musk decided to start complying with the rules. And of course, this poses for us other issues. X, uh, I think that it is a really tricky, tricky thing because all these uh, niche, right-wing niche platforms such as Gab, 
parlor, all of them attempt, attempted to be Twitter one day. Their main goal was to uh, not only have ne uh, uh, right wing uh, people in this in this in, the, in their services, but also expand their user base to achieve other uh, other users and to increase their their importance. Uh, but Twitter, after Musk. Uh, Musk's acquisition, it became itself a niche platform. It started, people, The Guardian even recently uh, excluded its account, its account from X. And we are seeing even more people with uh, more radical content in the platform. And it became itself a far right niche nowadays. Uh, but so X was not so important in terms of user base in Brazil. It had 17 million uh, users in a country of 200 million uh, inhabitants. So it was not so important as Meta that has 100,000 uh, users. 98% of the Brazilian population have WhatsApp, for example. It's not at all so important as those platforms. But it had like uh, importance regarding the news, regarding the regarding the the, pol the politics in general, the politics discussion, and its block, of course, doesn't uh, doesn't is not does not affect heavily freedom of expression. But for example, if another issue like this happens again, and Starlink decides not to comply with the, the rule again. Now Sterling uh, has 46% of internet provision in Brazil and its suspension, the suspension of Starlink's operation would hugely impact uh, the Brazilian population in general. So we would need uh, an alternative, actually for also competition purposes, we need an alternative to Starlink. And now Brazil announced a partnership with the Space Sail, uh, that is a Chinese company that Brazil is going to partner with to be able to create a like a possible comp a viable competition to uh, Starlink in the country. Of course, uh, just to finish, this is not at all like a good alternative, uh, the ideal <laughs> alternative. <laughs> But Brazil would need to invest heavily in the in the development of their own software, their own satellite uh, internet provision. Other countries like the United States, all of this, all of, all of the main technology that we have today were uh, developed because of industry policies, because of governmental uh, funding. We need this in Brazil. But our first satellite was. Uh, developed in 2021, the Amazonia one, Amazonia first. And yes, we still need industrial policies for develop our, our uh, digital sovereignty strategies in, in the country. And that's it. Thank you so much. And sorry again yeah, for the delay. No. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is extremely helpful. Um, wow, 46%. That's, that's crazy. Thank God the Chinese are going to save us. <laughs> uh, Russia also has something you know, that they would like to sell us. Probably. Um, Professor Carol will um, give us some comments. I have a couple of things to say. Hopefully we'll have time for some Q&A. Yes, thank you so much. This is super interesting and super troubling. <laughs> um, 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 so, shoot. I have a few comments about differences in freedom of speech regulation. but. Um, uh, and so just very quickly, it is true that the, the intermediary liability uh, regime you're talking about resembles our statutory uh, scheme, but with a big difference. Our courts are not involved in that. Uh, so, so on our copyright, if you've seen on YouTube, this video is not available because of copyright. That's not because a court in the U.S. said that. It's because our legislation says if the copyright owner contacts YouTube and YouTube doesn't take it down, then they can be liable. So our, so our government is not involved in that content 
Because if our government was, I think the First Amendment would prohibit the kinds of content regulation that your courts are engaged in. So I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about, they're, they're basically, the, there are these different free speech traditions. In the US, our tradition has, our answer to harmful speech has always been more speech. If there's false speech, don't censor it, just put truthful speech out there. But I do think that social media is putting that premise that the marketplace of ideas can function under a lot of pressure. And so I think there are arguments. Uh, but then the flip side is the concern about the state. How is the judge in a position to decide what counts as fake news? Uh, you know, isn't that, doesn't that give too much power to the government on that? And so I have that question, but also this Starlink is really, to me, that's more fundamentally concerning because uh, on the one hand, Elon Musk has these cross-ownership relationships with, with the, both X and Starlink. And from a corporate company law perspective, to have one of your companies acting against its own interest to, to service the interest of X, like that would be a complete violation of our company law. And I'd be curious to hear your reactions on whether that's part of why Starlink complied as well. Those are my two big questions. Okay, so uh, regarding the last question, I think this, this one is easier uh, because it was actually a chess, a chess, a chess game played by uh, Alexandre Moraes. Uh, they actually didn't, did not issue uh, Starlink's uh, account, uh, economic accounts blocking. Only uh, communicated that they would do so, and then Starlink backed with the, its decision, uh, because that's it. It be proved that uh, there was a conglomerate with these two companies, and this would go against the competition law in Brazil. Probably uh, put them both under a conglomerate investigation within the CAD, the Authority of Competition in Brazil. And regarding the first question, uh, so copyrights and NSCII, uh, the non-consensual intimate imagery abuse, both of them, according to the Brazilian civil rights framework, are also exemptions, uh, exemptions from the general regime. Both of them uh, cannot can uh, be a note. They are under a notice and takedown regime. So if you have like a copyright violation. Actually, what Mark Seville does, what the Internet Bill of Rights does, it does a remission to the Copyright Act that has in itself a notice and takedown regime. And for NSTII as well. And regarding the, the fake news, the misinformation combat by the courts in Brazil, so we don't have a law right now saying what is fake news, trying to criminalize fake news itself or any other attempt in this matter. What we have now are the electoral uh, court resolutions on the subject. And of course, calumny, uh, injury, all of this that are uh, also ty so, uh, types of disinformation uh, are also crimes in the country within the penal code, within the civil code, they are also uh, potentially, uh, uh, potentially, the, the right on the right holder can sue other party for these violations. Uh, but what the electoral court uh, resolutions and uh, what the provisions uh, try to to establish is, is coordinated campaigns, coordinated information campaigns are forbidden. Uh, the, the distribution, the mass distribution of, and I have like some slides with the case law here. Some distributions of uh, mass distribution of this information via messaging apps also could constitute abuse of economic power and misuse of media. This was a case uh, with, involving Bolsonaro and Hamilton Mourão, that was uh, one of his ministers. Uh, but of course. Sorry? Well, that was his running mate. Was yes. the vice president. Yeah. Yes, it was vice president. Uh, 
but also to identify what actually is a mass campaign. It is. It needs a, a mass distribution campaign. It needs evidence. And this case was dis dismissed because of the lack of evidence of this and became a case law. And so we are not. Ha we do not have judges deciding what's truth and what is not. They are basically evaluating if there are coordinated attacks, coordinated campaigns, financial activities uh, for to finance uh, uh, those sort of mass distribution of this information. But this, ne this all needs evidence, this all needs uh, proofs. And I think it's better to have judges deciding about this, this issues because then you can appeal, of course, with all this problems on go this issues ongoing with the Supreme Court uh, legitimacy. Uh, but it's better this than any other uh, sort of organization of institutional arrangements that could make uh, uh, give more power to federal authorities uh, because courts actually their decisions can be reviewed by other by other courts. But also the draft, the draft bill 2630, the one that was shelved and it's not uh, going to be discussed really soon. Uh, they also had an authority to, uh, that would be able to conduct audits, internal audits in big tax, uh, to also try to mitigate these harms as the DSA, as the Digital Services Act arrangement does. Uh, but again, it would not decide what is truth and what's false. This authority would on, only do this audit actually to feed, possibly feed investigations with evidence or not. Uh, or not. Did you want to say something? Or? Yeah, I think well, further things, it is important to, to recognize that the freedom of expression regime in the U.S. is the exception in the democratic world, right? It's not that a, so uh, no other country has uh, a, a perspective that is so absolute in the protection, but that we know that it's not, right? And recently we had a, a, a rapper convicted uh, of murder because of the lyrics in his uh, in his rap that was used as so when and and so the flex the, the ability to 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 also be flexible around that when they are persecuting specific uh, why not ethnic groups in the country uh, is uh, is is clear too right so I think that, that that's so I think that that's important to step but I agree and I think. Also, what, what, uh, in Brazil, the regime around elections is very specific, right? So the level of control that, uh, the judiciary has over political campaigns and what can and can't be said, what kind of attacks is tolerable or not is, is, is a tradition, right? And it's in line, I think, with, uh, with, uh, with the, the, the Brazilian constitution or that was built into kind of building the democracy to create some rules of uh, uh, preventing uh, lies, attack, distortions in the power of economics. I think in this country it was the opposite, right? I think freedom of speech was used to tolerate the abuse of economic power, right, in, in, in elections with uh, Citizens United. So in Brazil, it's the opposite, right? It, there is a lot of control, not in general in public life, but when it is around elections that goes from the specific things that one candidate or the other can say, how, what, what a, even if like a, a, a what a, a, a broadcast, if it offers the space for one candidate, it has to offer the same space for the other. So there is a lot of control that. And also, and this was kind of developed afterwards, but was clearly used here a lot, in protecting the integrity of the system. So everything that is attempting to attack the integ integrity of the system, asking people not to, or to boycott, or to, right, in ways that is based on the kind of uh, uh, not believing, right, in the system itself, was heavily uh, 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 exercised by the, and also the, but I think you're right that there is a question there, right, in terms of, and I don't think uh, it's worse or better to have kind of private uh, 
uh, citizens uh, being able to uh, uh, remove content uh, that is based on kind of uh, 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 intellectual property uh, restrictions or uh, the state being able to, again, in the way that we have independent uh, uh, judiciary in Brazil to, to control it. But especially the fact that people cannot contest and even ask for kind of printed or, you know, attack the, 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 the electronic voting in Brazil and all that, I think sometimes we reach a limit that is beyond what the court should be doing, right? I think we should be free to criticize uh, 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 the electronic machines in, in, right in any way. And I think there is an excess that, it, that I think is part of, of, of your concern. But I think the, the, the other option, which is this kind of absolute freedom that allows the economic power to take advantage of it and convert it in what's definitely not freedom. I think I don't think it's not an alternative. Well, I have comments, but uh, I want to open up to our students if they want to chime in with questions or comments. I feel like there'll be a good time. We can go a couple of minutes over depending on people's schedules, but if students, I want to give students a space. You have to, but if you want to, yeah. I wanted to know what you guys think of the spotlight on Alexandre de Moraes as an individual instead of the court as an institution. And does it show strength for the court or does it make it too vulnerable for attack? Like, is it good or bad for it, the court's legitimacy? I think, can I jump sure. in? Yeah. Uh, I think this is due to the monocratic uh, system that the court has become come basically allowing any judge to decide monocratically, decide individually. Uh, this is a symptom, actually, that Alexandre Moraes became this, this, uh, the, the main person in this to increase because he was also the head of uh, the, the court, but, al but also because of main... Uh, so the, the the Supreme Court it also operates with uh, how do you say sorteo? It's a lottery oh, system. A lottery system yeah. where the the cases can be uh, direct, directed to any of the, the justices and Alexandre de Moraes by 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 chance or not became the main justice where uh, to these cases, the lottery system, all the case, the main cases regarding Bolsonaro, regarding other politi uh, uh, relevant politicians, uh, they were all assigned to Alexandre Moraes. And of course, by chance or not, we don't actually know how the lottery system within uh, the, the Supreme Court operates. Alexandre Moraes became this, this individual uh, uh, force within the Supreme Court, but also I think uh, not only regarding these cases, uh, but other cases where the uh, the judges, the justice, they can decide mon monocratically. I think this uh, meeting, this actually reduces the institutionality, the, the image of institutionality of the court. I think we should actually uh, uh, debate as a society, and this was ongoing in the Congress, of course, with tons of other issues that we know in Brazil uh, regarding corruption and the, also the, the conservative forces that are against uh, the Supreme Court nowadays. Uh, we need to think about the other model where the plenary, the full, the full court could actually be deciding uh, more and we should have less monocratic uh, decisions from individual judges, also to protect the court uh, as itself. Tons of other reforms could be uh, could be thought as well to protect the court in this manner. But just a quick clarification for you that you didn't get it. So the Brazil, the Supreme Court decides a hundred thousand cases a year, not a hundred, a hundred thousand cases a year. So the only way you can possibly do that is to give individual justices the ability to decide a bunch of cases on their own and not just as the court put together. So that's what it creates. We actually have a court constituted with 11 different courts. Each justice is its own court in a sense. And some cases go to the entire court system, but individual just have a lot of power because they decide literally thousands of cases every year. So that's, that goes to the you know, personification 
uh, of each justice, not to speak of egos and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, f the fact that the, the discussions are broadcast live. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So, if, yeah, so there's a TV channel yeah. <laughs> uh, with, with discussion. So you can imagine how that looked like. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Reality TV. Yes? I had a question about, so you had mentioned, this is my whole thing, uh, you had mentioned checks and balances, and I guess I'm wondering how the judicial power in Brazil has checks and balances in a way that citizens can feel ensured that their speech is not overtaken, because I understand that this is all uh, to combat fake news, but yeah. I think like citizens can sometimes steer to the other side of like, how can this affect me negatively, so what are the checks and balances in place? Good question. Okay. Excellent question. Yeah. Do you think more than one question? And sure. Can... Let's take another one. Anyone else? Yeah, Garrett. Recognizing that there is a number of cultural, legal, tradition differences between um, the U.S. and Brazil, uh, you know, to the point of the, how we view the First Amendment. You can see this in Europe as well, uh, which I've always sort of thought of as tracing back to Europe's uh, experiences with the collective impact of harm and propaganda and stuff. Um, but we've been talking about sort of the scope and content of the right. I've seen some commentary that has sort of said, yeah, maybe this isn't appropriate for the Supreme Court to be doing, but the ends justify the means right now because of the, the uh, serious interests and threats involved. So it's very, very hard for people in the US legal system to think about a court um, sort of sua sponte exercising the power and authority to be both judge and executor of law, right, and jury. Yep. And, and especially in a situation where, and I don't think this is the first time, I think there have been like some of the blocking of Facebook in the past. Um, it's the court basically being concerned about criticisms of a court, yep. right? So you become your own plaintiff and judge in this, and is, what's the concern there going yeah. forward? We're like two others, maybe. Yeah, yeah let's, let's two, two other, yeah, the two in the back, that we can. Yeah. Have you. I was just curious on your professional view on whether this project could deal with Yeah. Um, can you speak a bit more to the challenges, say, like arising from this case around the connection of the dots in presenting enough evidence to show that there was a direct link between the spread of messaging on communication apps or social media platforms to the to the outcome of like an electoral process? Because I think that's one of the thorny areas that gets in the way of uh, actually deciding that disinformation or malicious information campaigns uh, are able to be ac accurately targeted because it's hard to prove that link yeah. that it led to this outcome. Yeah. Okay. Any thoughts? Yeah, oh, many. <laughs> all, all good questions. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start with the, the last one, because I think it's uh, maybe easier, which is the, the, the ability to... Uh, so there are two things. One thing is the act of spread, uh, misinformation or lies or, you know, interfering in the, the electoral process, it can be punished or prevented, or, you know, you can ask uh, content to be removal, and it wouldn't if the, the, the need to connect the dots would be needed in Brazilian legislation to uh, nullify an election, right? So if you connect the dots, you would be able, and you have, we have many times for local elections, 
not necessarily based on disinformation, but based on corruption, of kind of buying votes, on, you know, I don't know, if someone offered $1 million for an elector to sign a petition, right, in a country, like something like that, <laughs> we could, we could, uh, uh, in Brazil, this could uh, prevent someone to be elected, right? This would be uh, enough evidence of concrete. What what is in discussion here is is a it's a different layer which is and and my personal opinion if we had the kind of investigation that we're having right now for the 2018 election in Brazil probably we could identify Bolsonaro election I think there was enough evidence of uh, the use of uh, illegal misinformation access the way they bought data I mean I won't enter but I think there was enough but the, the court wasn't there and and it wasn't. Uh, what is being discussed here is the connection between the attacks on the electoral system itself, so the attacks on democracy, and, again, the, 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 the threat to the democracy and the fact that it was a coup attempt, right? So, and I think that was well proven in a way, but it's different, and, and it's, I think it's easier to, to demonstrate this than to demonstrate the electoral connection as you are. But this was, uh, would have been discussed. I think on, on the question on, on, and I think it's related also to, to checks and balances. I think so many, many things here. One is, of course, I think there were excesses in the Supreme Court, uh, speci uh, again, in the way, and we are talking, it's, it's really hard to compare with the U.S. because the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't have the kind of criminal, right? And, and, uh, um, but, the, and, and also, I think it's very important to make some differentiation, the fact that by law, uh, uh, um, a general prosecutor or attorney general cannot say, I will not prosecute that. That's illegal, right? In, that, in, those, in the way that in Brazil, in the U.S., they can't. So if there is a crime, you have a duty to prosecute. So... When we have a, a, prosecutor, a general prosecutor that is not kind of really complying with the duties of, it created a reaction that, again, and it wasn't just force of creating, force of nature or something. There was, of course, legal provisions and all that, that the Supreme Court needed to respond. And from day one, when this started, I think a lot of people say, this is very dangerous, right? Because we are in a period of kind of exceptional power from the executive. They are kind of going beyond. They are, to say the least, paying constitutional hardball here. How the institutions will respond to that, right? And I think there is, of course, uh, um, you know, people who'd say we, the way to respond to abuse is to preserve the institutions and all the rules, right? That can be dangerous, right? I think if they had said uh, if they have done that, we would have uh, 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 had a, a, a coup attempt. We don't have the counterfactuals, right? But I think it is. I think it's uh, the point is how you put the the, the toothpaste back in the in the tube again, right? <laughs> it's uh, it is it is it is really hard, and I think. It is our duty also to point it out right now and to say, well, we need to, to you know, be much more careful. And, and we are seeing that also the current general prosecutor, which is someone that was very independent, that is very independent, and his team are complaining about the, well, now we have an independent prosecutor, uh, general prosecutor, and why the courts are still doing that, right? So I think it is dangerous. I think they've crossed limits, and it is now that, uh, that, uh, that, um, Democracy is being restituted in Brazil. It is important also to kind of uh, make sure uh, uh, those checks and balances uh, are there. In terms of checks and balances for, I don't know if you want to, to, to take on that, but I think there are, of course, uh, uh, there is a possibility of impeachment of uh, Supreme Court justices uh, by the Senate. And that's all, always a threat that is there and it's part of the game and part of Bolsonaro campaign. Uh, to the Senate right now is we need to have enough senators to impeach uh, uh, justice. So again, to get control, and and I think that's uh, uh, that's definitely not healthy either, right? And but most of the cases, uh, 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 I think the kind of 
the ability to have a court of appeal, right? Most of the cases are not in the Supreme Court on that, right? The court, the individual cases, right? And and I think in that case, I think there are enough checks and balance with the kind of the appeals, the uh, different courts that will review the case. And again, the way that justices are appointed and judges are appointed in Brazil, which is much more kind of related to a civil bureaucracy than political appoint- appointees like, like, like here. So in general, I'm less concerned in the kind of, the, the, the whole kind of spine of the judiciary, right, around all checks and balances. In the Supreme Court, it can become as dangerous as we are seeing right now, which is it becomes just a political fight, and it's not checks and balances in the kind of more noble sense, I think, of it. Yeah, I, I don't have much more to add to, to Professor Bramovay's uh, uh, considerations. I think that we have ongoing, I didn't put this here, but we have an ongoing uh, discussion, as I mentioned before, in the, within the Congress, uh, trying to reform how the uh, Supreme Court operates. I think this is a debate that the civil society ca- uh, have, has also to, to be engaged with, uh, so also to avoid that these transformations do not curb excessively the power of the Supreme Court. But first, this would be uh, this this needs uh, this needs to to this need to reform this is the the Supreme Court institution needs to uh, pass uh, for uh, needs to uh, uh, talk also about how the reviewer system uh, goes within the Supreme Court. It needs to be divided. We need to be, have a court that all, only discusses constitutional uh, arg- uh, arguments. And also uh, review only last as last resort cases that uh, uh, are unlawful and uh, uh, violates uh, citizens' rights. Uh, but the amount of cases that goes that are dis- being discussed uh, within the Supreme Court, uh, it is unfeasible to have only eleven uh, eleven justices discussing nowadays. And Yes, I think we should also have man- mandates for the Supreme Court. It's a matter of uh, like terms for the, the Supreme Court. We need to have more uh, uh, a renewal from, from the Supreme Court with more uh, predictability, because otherwise the justices, they can uh, retire themselves or be retired because of their age uh, in really uh, tricky moments for the country. And men, I think the terms could be also like 15 years to, uh, of a term could be enough to have like a, a solid institution, uh, but also to allow this renewal of the, the, the Supreme Court in itself. And also it's important to, to mention uh, the Supreme Court is not acting right now to protect the left. Mm-hmm. It is it, the perception could be this, but it's not. Actually, they were uh, prosecuting several of the people who are in the government right now uh, in the, during the car wash operation, one of the major uh, corruption operations in Brazil. Uh, so they are not protecting the left wing; they are protecting themselves, and of course, yep. they are exceeding their power in doing so. And this is, of course, these sex excesses are what we need to be looking at with more uh, a, a more over more oversight from the civil society and but i think as the with the coup attempt the civil society organizations are also as professor uh, derek mentioned they are also uh stepping out of this i think uh because it is easier to just uh, uh, uh legitimize these actions in order to uh, curb a coup, coup attempt. And I don't think this, uh, uh, the oversight or the pressure uh, regarding the Supreme Court is coming uh, every, any day soon because the things, things are escalating right now in Brazil with yeah. the discovery of the plans to, yeah. to kill Lula and uh, Alckmin and, and Alexandre de Moraes. So, yeah, I think that's it. I don't have many much, much more to add. Well, we are uh, 50 minutes over, so we should close up. I do want to say one th- interesting thing, which is it seems like a lot of discussion involving the role of courts in fighting misinformation takes the point of view of, you know, we need 
more chords or something like chords. You see a lot of discussions about content moderations if it's either outside or inside social media companies to create institutions that resemble chords with transparency, an appeal system, maybe an impartial arbiter. And I think what we're seeing more and more is that although I think courts are fairly good at deciding factual issues, I feel the courts have evolved centuries to create institutions, norms, procedures to do that. It's fundamentally really at odds with the speed and, and, and breadth of misinformation spreading.